I have a friend by the name of Anastasia. I met her shortly after the start of the Russian invasion. Ever since I first entered Ukraine, she has been a tremendous help to me. Whether it was through translation, fixing, or just giving me her time. While she has helped me with many stories in Ukraine, she also has a story of her own. On July 11th, 2022, in the eastern Ukrainian city of Kharkiv, her father, while sitting on his front porch, was killed by a Russian grad rocket that landed in their front yard, while her mom barely avoided death. This video is from a few months after that, when I went to Kharkiv in order to see how it was faring during the war, see the community Anna grew up in, and hear her story. Hey guys, um, this is Dylan. It is September 12th, and I am currently on a train that is about to uh, disembark into the city of Kharkiv. While I was getting ready, Ukraine launched a massive counteroffensive in the area. It was the biggest counteroffensive of the whole war, and it's taken back the most territory you could imagine. I mean, it is it is taking back the entirety of the Kharkiv Oblast, and so I'm supposed to be here for a week. And what I'm fearful of is that due to Russia's failure, their response to this counteroffensive, which has destroyed their line, will be terrorized civilian population, since we're never going to take the city of Kharkiv. And so the Russians seem to have a policy of, uh, you know, if we can't have it, nobody can. With the counteroffensive still ongoing along the fringes of the region, you could hear the sound of shelling often in the background. A constant dreadful thud to remind you of the violent battles happening just miles away. The bombardment often spilled into the city itself, as they would find out later in the day. Our first stop, though, was an example of this in a way. Anna's childhood school, or what remained of it. Uh, I performed here when I was a, a child. What uh, performance? What like theater stuff, so. Uh, now it's not that good looking as it was, but it used to be a fun space. It was a stage play with the uh, high schoolers who were ready to uh, leave school pretty much. And uh, I was uh, 11 or 12 at the time, and I performed with high schoolers, and I thought I was hell cool. You are so <laughs> cool because it got to be with the big kids. <laughs> yes. <laughs> did you like the school? Yes, I did. Do you have a mascot? Uh, what's that? A mascot. A mascot's like a like a team a like a school animal or a school. Ah, no, 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 no. You didn't no, have no, those. No. Yeah. Is that so American? That's an American very, very thing. Very American thing. <laughs> I don't know. We don't have stuff like that. I'm just a Yankee over here. Artillery, it's uh, this kind of whistle sound. It's uh, very loud and uh, it grows uh, louder, light, louder when it's closer to you. And then it's like, like very dull sound. Mm -hmm. So the shrapnel and stuff just flies all over the place, shreds people, shreds buildings and stuff mm -hmm. like that. With a rocket, it's much more like um, similar to plane, I would say, the sound mm -hmm. is. And uh, the explosion is uh, it's like boom and then explosion loud sound artillery mm -hmm. does not make those loud explosion more like, sound. More like boom like mm -hmm. that so that's pretty much when you know also the sound when it's closer to you is very different rocket sounds a lot like a plane but less noisy basically mm -hmm. plane makes more noise but uh, artillery is mostly a whistle or something like that so that is bum bum dull sounds so it's that's artillery that it either anti-air uh, or artillery yes yeah. But the whistle, you can hear if it's smirch or something like that. It was very nice of them to give us an example. Yeah, right. Kind, kind, right? This wasn't the only school Anna had showed me. She also took me to a local kindergarten, which had a Russian missile destroy its playground shortly before I arrived. The school director reported that no children were present during the strike, with the school staff barely missing a tragic fate. I saw ruins all around the city which the Russian army shelled ruthlessly once it became clear the city would not submit itself to occupation. The east end of the city was particularly bomb-riddled and full of burnt-out husks of apartment homes. Some of them were so destroyed, it appeared as if someone had cleaved the buildings in half. I'm a local resident here. I got 
такую вот ситуацию. So he's, uh, from here, from ну, нету бездомных, остался бездомный в том, что есть, в то есть. Все, что было, все осталось здесь. Машина была здесь стояла разбитая. Разбил, у меня Ford Transit был. Дайте мне минуточку часть перевести. Mm -hmm. So he says that he is uh, uh, from here. He was left with basically nothing. Mm -hmm. So the clothes he has is what he has, and uh, his car was destroyed. His entire area where he lived was destroyed. So mm -hmm. yeah, he, this is the situation he's in now. Mm -hmm. А так больше ничего не осталось. Вот что дальше будет? Как зиму пережить? Не знаем как. So he says that uh, he, they're very confused how they will survive the winter mm -hmm. with these conditions because it's cold and, you know, they have no windows, no, like, uh, heat system, nothing, so... Ну, надеемся на лучшее. But they hope for the best. Духом не падаем. Духом не падаем. Spirits are still... Так что, спасибо за то, что помогают нам все. От сердца спасибо. He says thank you from his heart from, to America and to Western people to, for help. <laughs> Спасибо русскому миру. Uh, yeah. Нет. <laughs> Будь не проклят. He says he curses oh. Russians basically okay. and Russian peace. Спасибо. Yeah. Well, that was kind of sweet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the destroyed buildings that Anna wanted to show me was a recreational sports facility used by local youth, which construction workers were trying to repair. That's when the Russians decided to target the city's electrical grid in order to undercut Kharkiv's power supply. Yeah, so when I was here still in March, I think, uh, maybe second or, or third, I'm not sure, but in the beginning of March, this we heard in our apartment. It was incredibly impactful, large explosions, two, one and then the other one. Uh, and two rockets uh, hit this uh, poor complex and uh, we heard it, in fact, it was so loud that the whole apartment block shook and it is like 15 minutes away from here, so it's mm -hmm. not exactly very close. Uh, windows uh, fall off because of that on the neighboring buildings and yeah, so we can probably go and just, you know, see it up close, but it's just uh, a sport complex for people to train and um, that's it. I honestly have no idea why they bombed it. Maybe they thought that uh, uh, soldiers were hiding here or something. Were there any trace of soldiers uh, here? No, no. We went here straight after it was bombed. So like on the next day, basically, and nothing was even remotely uh, close to. Uh, no equipment, no storage, no nothing. Just your usual uh, stuff for sports Mixed and uh, yes, balls and stuff. yeah, mm. yeah, balls. There was a lot of all. Uh, there was a big court, uh, basketball court there. So we, when we went in with my sister, there were like these balls, set balls, all over the floor. And um, yeah, and uh, just the guys who worked in this, uh, um, you know, trainers basically, who trained kids and uh, young but people. You said they, they survived, but they had a close call. Yes, they both have been in there at the time. They heard the, like it was closing in and they just dropped to the floor and they survived pretty much with mostly no injuries at all. So they showed us, me and my sister, everything in there and tell, told us what happened. But uh, they survived, yeah, luckily for them, because it was quite a strike. Two rockets and direct hit, which we will see. After some time passed, while the city's power was still knocked out by the Russian attacks on the city's electrical infrastructure, we eventually made our way to Anna's father's old home. This is where he had been killed by the Grad rocket strike. We were unable to enter the burnt out remains of their home due to safety concerns, but you did not need to go inside to see how the Russians left their mark. The porch that Anna's father had been standing on was gone, completely destroyed by the explosion. Say something quick. Uh, hey, hello. Say something a little bit louder. Uh, hello, can you hear me? 
That's better. Okay. That's better. Okay. Fantastic. So. What's your name? My name is Anastasia Paraskevova. I'm 28 years old. I was born here in Kharkiv, and this is my father's house. He lived his most of his life here, basically. You were born and raised here? Yep. You like Kharkiv a lot? <laughs> yeah, I do. My favorite place, I guess. Home. Nothing is like home, they say. So, why are we here today? So, we're here today because uh, two months ago, uh, my father was killed by Russian rocket. Uh, not rocket exactly, it's actually artillery, smerch. Uh, and uh, the, um, this kind of like explosion happened in the yard of his house. This is a residential area, only pretty much uh, people live here and uh, just shops and residential houses and that's it. This is my father's two-store uh, house he lived in with my mom at the time. Uh, my mom uh, returned to Kharkiv in May and she stayed with him uh, from there on. So, uh, in 10 in the morning, uh, Monday, it was 11th of, uh, uh, what it, was it, July, yeah, July. So, basically, he was standing on the balcony, and uh, when the time of the impact, and the rocket hit the yard, destroyed pretty much everything in the yard, also shredded the house, and my father died instantly on the balcony. Uh, his injuries were very, very severe, so um, medics say he died like instantly, so that's kind of good, he did not suffer. So his hand was turned uh, turn away off, uh, in his insides were out and all sorts of stuff. My mom was in the house inside the building, so she survived. She only got like scratches and um, rubble uh, fall on her, but she survived. So. Um, there was uh, a, a hit uh, flying nearby and my father went to the balcony to see where the smoke was basically where the heat was and uh, she asked them she also went to the balcony and she asked him to get inside it's not safe and he's like waved her off basically and she went back to the house and she he stayed in the balcony and that's when the flying in the yard happened so it was like five six seconds uh, and my mom would be dead too basically so she then uh, came to her senses she came she stood up she was trying to understand what the fuck happened and uh, she start started calling him sorry it's all right a minute it's okay take as much time as you need so she started calling for him and then she saw what she saw on the balcony <laughs> that's how it happened sorry it's okay take as much time as you need yeah do you need a second no no fine okay. so she then uh, called my sister we she and I were in Poltava at the time and she called her and she was screaming she couldn't say anything coherently then the policeman who arrived at the place uh, she he uh, told all this what happened so he basically said that uh, the um, the sh uh, smerch russian smerch hit your house the yard your the father uh, died and your mother is fine so my sister went to wake me up it was like 10 around 10 in the morning and she said I wake up, um, we have a tragedy, our father was killed and I asked immediately if mother was fine because I knew they live in the same house. Can I and ask you, um, did, yeah. did she give you a second to wake up or is it like she shook you up and immediately... No, pretty much up? she just said wake up, wake up and she said uh, what she said, like we have tr well, the tragedy happened, uh, our father was killed. So that was the morning, then we tried to somehow pull ourselves together to come here and uh, see mother and um, talk to her and to just help with the uh, with the procedures like with the body with the uh, with the house to find something useful in the house to give it to the army to our friends before the marauders pretty much came in and took everything and when you say marauders can you explain what that is it's like people who pretty much take advantage of war and stuff and they steal shit from the ruined houses and uh, ruined shops and stuff like that. Is that why front doors currently uh Yeah, so, so that people would not come in and uh, that's not much to steal honestly, but still I don't want people to be hanging around in his house. So yeah, 
that's the story basically. So, when you found out, when you found out that this happened, um, how how did you process that information? It's really hard to process things like that. Uh, you kind of is a bit numb at the time, so you can't really. Um, fully understand what happened you can only do that months later I think so um, it was a shock of course but you kind of I kind of knew it could happen there was always this potential you know they live in Kharkiv my father would not want to live we asked him many times to live in Poltava with us for a while so you have you did ask him to leave yeah home. yeah also to go to Greece uh, because we have relatives in Greece and we're Greek like ethnically so we wanted him to live but he wouldn't he pretty much uh, did not want to leave not his house and not uh, this place he really loved it his yard his house his cat <laughs> cat survived by the way she's in Poltava so uh, yeah and uh, my mom decided to stay with him because of that uh, to be with him basically so he would not be alone and every time, every day, the flyings uh, were like three, four strikes here in Kharkiv. And I would call them every day and I would ask them if they're fine, if they're alive. No need to phone my father now, but that's how it was for a while. They, My mom came here in May uh, because it was temporarily better, basically. So for a week or maybe two even, uh, there were almost no strikes. And people got a little bit too comfortable, I guess. But then the strikes uh, renewed with double force, pretty much. It was just as bad as it was in March, when we were still here, the entire family was here. So, yeah, that's, that's the story. Do you think you've completely processed what happened? I think so, right now, yeah, I would say. You don't have time to mop around, you know. So, uh, I have mom, who needs really needs supports right now. So, me and my sister, we, like, pulled ourselves together pretty quickly. So, like, a couple weeks, and we were, like, going on pretty much with life so maybe when this is all over it will be a time to you know like properly I guess grief and stuff but so no. you think once the war is over you'll be able to grieve maybe I'm not sure it's like a thought basically but um, I think we're pretty much uh, okay kind of okay now for that also mother like I said needs uh, support she does not need us to mop about do you so. think your father fully understood um, the risks of staying in Kharkiv, a city that was kinda, bombarded so heavily? Kind of not, actually, but uh, it's uh, something like you have, we also used to joke about it all the time, that there's many houses in Kharkiv. So basically, big city, many houses, why it's supposed to hit your house? Uh, so many places to strike, why, it's, why would you strike in your house in particular? But then this happened. So 1% of probability is still a probability, basically, is what I'm saying. It can happen, and it did in this time. My father thought this was a safe area, kind of safe, semi-safe, I guess, because there was no money, not many hits here. This is pretty much like one of the only ones, my father's house, that uh, strikes that were here. So three, maybe two. But um, yeah, so he basically thought he was much safer than he actually was. But this many people live like that. They, you cannot uh, always think look I'm gonna die I'm gonna die rocket gonna hit me any moment if you live like that you will lose your mind basically so you really need to kind of like move on I guess live your life as if uh, almost as if nothing is going on or leave unless you can leave of course but uh, if you live every day in that fear it's impossible so many people like uh, feel a, a little bit invincible I would say here so my father was definitely like that. He was also extremely stubborn like a mole. So he would not listen when I asked him to go, at least go to the house, basically. Not go to the balcony, go to the house, just two walls, something like that to protect you from the... As you can see, it did work because my mama did survive. She was pretty much unscratched in the, um, in the house. So, yeah, if he was not on the balcony, he probably would not die. But uh, my mom, as she knows him for many, many years, 38 years, so she said that if he saw uh, what happened to his horse, house, his yard, he would pretty much mo possibly die from a heart attack, basically. That's how much he liked the place, I guess. Your father liked the garden, didn't he? Yep. He grow roses and trees, nut trees, uh, pears, apricots were, were his favorite. His favorite, and I have an idea to maybe if I have money one day to rebuild this place and uh, to make it uh, like livable again and um, to 
do the garden uh, justice again and maybe bury his ashes in the under the apricot tree i think it would be great because i really love them you said you want to bury the ashes under an apricot mm -hmm. tree does that mean you guys have not been able to have a funeral yet uh, yeah we have um we wanted to send his body to Greece because that's what his relatives in Greece wanted to do and uh, we tried but it don't, did not work out so basically a lot of uh, like procedures and stuff uh, they, there was a mistake in his uh, patronym name uh, done by a guy who did uh, a certificate for his death basically like a document so we could not, were not able to send him to Greece his body was in Kiev for a good two weeks I think and uh, it's condition was so bad the body was so badly damaged like 85 percent of it basically so they could not properly uh, preserve the body so we had to make a decision basically to cremate him and i uh, received the uh, like this uh, uh, urn you call it urn i don't know how urn, to say yeah. Uh, yeah, the urn with his ashes i have to receive it via postal service in poltava which was a trip because i received his uh my what remained of my dad in a mall in a shopping mall so can yeah you, can you tell me about that experience yeah so i uh, they could not send the urn in a car or something and uh, they said we will send it by postal service and i was like well okay as long as it's done so they send it but the postal service office was inside a shopping mall so i went with my friend eager uh, I went there to pretty much pick him up and I went to the mall and there was like music playing, people like buying stuff and, and I was like not buying stuff, not receiving like clothing or like uh, food via mail, I was receiving my dad's remains, which is an interesting experience I would say. And uh, right in front of me, the guy who was, um, uh, who was receiving stuff via postal service, he was receiving umbrellas basically, so he, he was like uh, trying them on, like pink umbrella green umbrella and I was like can I have my dad's ashes please and uh, so they gave me the urn I was like laughing a little bit crying a little bit and then we you went told me about the music yeah the music there was like uh, I think it was Kalush playing which is like Ukrainian band that won the Re Eurovision uh, Eurovision and uh, it was uh, like I said kind of like an experience to uh, take your dad's remains uh, uh, while listening to the rap music inside a, a shopping mall so yeah, that's how it went down. Now the urn is in Poltava, pretty much, and I we will wait until the war is done, and then we will. I hope we can uh, rebuild the house somehow and bury him here. I think that's the plan. Is there anybody you hold responsible for? Who whose fault do you think it is that so many people like your father? Have well, died? it's pretty obvious, I guess. <laughs> it's Russia, of course. Who who's else? It's Russian rocket that killed him. It's a uh, war that killed so many people. Uh, not only my father died, uh, many people died. In the oblast, I think 31 person died that day. So it was a pretty intense shelling uh, that day. And many families experienced the exact same thing my did, uh, mine did. And they also experience it uh, every day, pretty much, since the war started. So it's not something special, I guess you could say. It's just another story like that. So yeah, it's uh, entirely the fault of Russian army and the invasion and their uh, their consistent desire to uh, take over Ukraine, to not let us live our lives as we see fit. And uh, the means they do it with is war and death. So that's about it, I guess. Is there any pleasant memories of your father you would like to share? Oh, I, a lot actually, but probably the best thing, he was a big jokester and he joked around a lot and uh, his jokes were like your typical dad jokes and uh, he loved themselves all the time. <laughs> like he would tell it and he would laugh afterwards and everyone was like, uh. <laughs> that was probably the best story. He also was a pretty good story storyteller. He told a lot of uh, stories from his Soviet years and how he survived as a Greek man from Georgia in the Soviet Union uh, and that was basically... Uh, he was a pretty great storyteller and he was uh, very good with his hands. He like fixed stuff around the house like... Handyman? Yeah, handyman and uh, yeah, so he really loved his uh, garden, he loved his house. He was um, a good father, I would say. What did he study in university? Uh, second. What did he study in university? Uh, it's physics. 
it was uh, he learned, started in the University of uh, National University of Karazina here in Ukraine in Kharkiv, like one of the biggest universities, and he studied physics there. What was your father's name? Uh, Georgi. If you could say something to your father, what would you say? Well, I'm um, kind of don't know. <laughs> Said he didn't uh, live long enough for the victory. Um, sorry. It's okay. Also, um, it really sucks that he missed the boxing <laughs> championship. Uh, that was Yusik versus yeah, Joshua, yeah? he really waited on that one. And his guy won Yusik. Yep, he did. My father would so watch this. Ukrainian champion of the world. Yep, good one. Hmm. Maybe that's it, I think. <laughs>